So Harker is a voting member, Dan, but we know that he's a hawk and he's spoken like a hawk several times. Why are we getting so caught up in his comments now? It's another sign, Vonnie, that the stars are aligning for an increase in the federal funds rate at some point in the next couple of meetings. I don't know that President Harker has been in the job long enough for us to quantifiably take a look at his voting record as we would say Charlie Evans or Jeff Lacker. He didn't take it off the table and I don't think any of them are going to take it off the table. The chair has said she wants to make an adjustment at the upcoming meetings. That means it could be March, it could be May, it could be June. Each of them has their own dynamic. Well, if her strategy, and there must be a little strategy here, right? They don't just look at the data every day and decide that day how they're going to strategize. If her strategy was to bring up the odds for March, but really move in May or June, she's done exactly that, right? The odds for March are now 38% according to WIRP. March is definitely a chance. The problem is if they start waiting till May or June, let's take two of those. With May, they keep saying every meeting is live, but few people actually believe it because they haven't moved in a meeting where there's been no press conference. Now, if they want to test that and shake that assumption, May wouldn't be a bad time to do it. However, you're bumping up against the French election and do they want to do something in such close proximity to geopolitical risk? On the other hand, if they wait until June, we get into the situation that John Williams described in his interview with us earlier this month. The arithmetic starts to box you in if you want to be credibly seen to be doing two or three. So you wait till June and people say, aha, so that means June, September, December. The element of surprise is gone, assuming they want that. This time last year, international development sort of put a break on the Fed's plans. Are they as aware of, I mean, obviously they're aware, but are they as fragile when it comes to international developments this year as they were last year? It's interesting, Vonnie, how we seem to be taking them at their word uh, this year about the dots, whereas this time last year, the prospect of four increases threw everyone into a tizzy. If you go back a year, what did we have? We had some market ructions in China. We had the deflation slash disinflationary scare uh, going in Europe. And there wasn't any sense really of whether wages would begin to get traction here. Now they're looking at a pretty benign international environment at a time when they're moving closer to their domestic goals. That's what gives us the sense that March is live. It's not a done deal. It's never a done deal. But, you know, March is definitely something to consider. And Dan, I want to bring people into the Bloomberg. We have a great chart, uh, Best Fed Chair. Maybe that's not a fair title, but it does show the Greenspan years, the Bernanke years and the Yellen years and the Fed's dual mandate. And honestly, if you look at Chair Yellen, her record here is fantastic. You know, the unemployment rate dropping all the way down to 4.8% and we're grinding, grinding higher with inflation. It's at 1.6% now and by some measures it's even above 2%. So how will history judge Yellen given that the current president may appoint up to, what, six people for the Federal Reserve? Look, it's way too soon. You know, Vonnie, remember when uh, Paul Volcker left, people thought, oh, he's irreplaceable. Then when Greenspan left, it was, how will we ever replace the maestro? Then when Bernanke left, it's like, God, gee, Ben will be a tough act to follow. So the history of the Yellen era may not be written for some time. I think she's been fortunate in the sense that she took over in 2014 after Bernanke had done the really tough stuff. And she was a participant in those discussions. But she did take over midway through this current expansion.